We will be studying the book of Colossians. And if you want to take notes, the best thing to do is to take down definitions of words or terms or a different translation that I may give. To try to take down uh, notes on everything that I say would be almost impossible unless you take shorthand. But I would suggest that you take notes by taking definitions of words or terms or a different translation that I might give and the rest of it is there as you follow the continuity of thought through the scriptures. If you know the meaning of the words, then you understand what is being recorded. Now, I would encourage you to keep a Bible open and follow word for word in everything that's being said. Uh, don't just sit there and listen to it, but follow it in the scriptures and it'll be far more meaningful and you'll get a lot more from it. It'll be very understandable if you will do that. Now, before we begin with Colossians 1.1, and in this first session, we're going to cover the first 20 verses of chapter 1. Before we begin, I want to give you a little background information, then I'll let you know when I'm ready to start with verse 1. In your thinking, I'd like for you to go with me to the Mediterranean Sea. You visualize the Mediterranean Sea. Let's go up to the northern shore. Let's go about halfway east-west. Extending northward out of the Mediterranean is the Aegean Sea. Now let's go about halfway up the Aegean Sea, and over on the eastern shore is the city of Ephesus. About 90 miles inland, further east, is the Lycus Valley. Nestled in that valley are the three cities of Hierapolis, Laodicea, and Colossae. Now the Apostle Paul had never been to that valley. However, on his third missionary journey, he spent three years in the city of Ephesus. From that vantage point, he evangelized all of Asia. During that period of time, a man from the Lycus Valley came to Ephesus, got in contact with Paul, was saved, and returned to the valley, and there he evangelized the three cities of Hierapolis, Laodicea, and Colossae. By and by, he became the pastor of the church of Colossae. And then eventually, a group of heretical teachers arose who had a threefold element to their heresy. First, they had a Judaistic element in which they sought to impose certain aspects of Judaism upon the believers. Secondly, there was an ascetic element in which they said, touch not, taste not, handle not certain things. You know, those ascetics are those people that say, don't eat anything that tastes good, just drink water, and uh, don't wear anything that's comfortable, wear scratchy clothing, such things as that. And then third and last of all was the mystical element, which was the worst element of all. And in that mystical element, they taught that Jesus Christ was not God, a very absolute God, and therefore one could not have a full and complete salvation in Christ alone. Epaphras was not handled, uh, capable of handling that kind of a problem, so he decided to make a trip to Rome to see Paul in order to be instructed by him. Having arrived in Rome when, where Paul was in prison, and Paul instructing him, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, Paul penned the epistle to the Colossians, and it was delivered to them by the hand of a man by the name of Tychicus. The epistle having arrived, we begin now in chapter 1, verse 1. Paul identifies himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, the word apostle simply means one who is sent on an errand with a message. So Paul says, I'm one sent on an errand with a message of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, I'm sent on this errand by means of or through the will of God. The word by is that little Greek preposition dia, which means by means of or through a will of God. The article that is added. So it's not, this is not the only will of God, but it was a will of God that he have that position of apostleship and be sent on that errand. So it's by means of or through a will of God and Timotheus or Timothy, the brother. Now our brother, literally the brother. Now Timothy is was not joint author of this epistle. It simply means that Timothy was with Paul at the time of the pinning of this epistle. And then he addresses himself to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ Jesus, which are at Colossae. Now, when he says to the saints and faithful brethren, he's not addressing himself to two different groups of believers, as if some were just saints set apart ones and others were faithful, but it is all the one and the same, and that will be pointed out further in the epistle, that all of the believers there in Colossae were faithful, as was reported to Paul by their pastor, Epaphras. Now, he says, to the saints and faithful brethren uh, who are in Colossae, not at, but in Colossae. So he's addressing himself to those who are there in that situation. Then notice the greeting which he gives. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
grace be unto you. The word be is added by the translators. The word unto is literally to. Now there's a difference in those two little prepositions, unto and to. Look here, let me give you an illustration. Here I have an object in fixed position. Here I have an object in motion toward that object. The word unto literally means in geometric relationships, in motion toward. The word to means it has arrived there, it's present. So Paul is not saying that grace is coming toward you, but he says, you have it already, it's arrived, it is with you. You have that grace of God. But now what is grace? Well, we often say grace is that undeserved, unearned, unmerited favor, and it is, but it's more than that. It's an unearned, undeserved, unmerited favor that does not demand return. Now, the word was commonly used among the Greeks. You know, as we meet one another on the streets, we say, hi, good day, what you say, how are you, something of that nature. But the Greeks met and they would say, grace, grace to you. In other words, they're saying, favor, may you have the favor of the gods upon you. Now, the Greek word grace was used commonly in this sense. Here's two young fellows, uh, little boys. They grow up as being good, close friends and buddies, pals all their life. They grow up into adulthood, and they're still friends throughout all of their adult years. One day, one of them falls into a very dire, serious need in his life for which he's not able to do anything to help himself. He's in a real dilemma, as we would say, in a pickle of a fix. He was really in a problem. Now his friend, motivated out of love for him, goes beyond the expectation and the call of duty of friendship to do and does a favor for his friend that he's never earned, deserved, or merited in any way. He does a favor to help him in his need and lift him up out of it. And he does it with no expectation that his friend ever have to do a like favor back unto him. That was grace in the secular sense as used by the Greeks. But when that word grace is placed into the New Testament, it is elevated to a much higher level. It is no longer a favor which is done for a friend. It is a favor which is done for an enemy. Now, in the beginning, because God created us in Adam, we were on friendship and loving relationship basis with God, and God came down in fellowship with man in Adam in the cool of the day on a daily basis. But when we sinned against God through Adam, we were separated and alienated from him. And the scripture says, by nature and by birth, we are at enmity with God. We are in a condition for which we can do absolutely nothing for ourselves. We're in a real dilemma as is described for us in the book of Romans chapter 3. But God, motivated out of love for us, extended a favor to us that we had never earned, deserved, or merited in any way a favor in which he sent his son Jesus Christ to pay that penalty of sin for us which we were not capable of paying in order to redeem us and lift us from the condemned state in nature. And God did it with no expectation that we should ever have to do a like favor back unto him. For when would God ever need such a favor? And if he did, how could we do it for us? That is grace as you find it in the word of God. So he says, grace is to you and peace. Now, not only is grace to you, you're recipients of that, and you have it in your presence with you, but you have the peace also. The word peace is from a Greek word which means a binding together. By nature and birth, we were separated and alienated from God. But because of that grace of God in Christ Jesus, we are reconciled or bound back together or brought back into loving relationship and fellowship with God. So he says, grace to you in peace, where does it come from? from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the way this is translated here seems to imply it's coming from two sources, from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, but that's not the case at all. In the Greek text, the article the is not there. It is added by the translators. So it literally says, from God our Father and Lord. That's all the same person. The word Lord meaning master owner. From God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Here, by the structure you have in the Greek, Jesus Christ defines for us who our God, our Father, and our Lord, our Master Owner, really is. Now, Christ became our Master Owner by buying us back from the condemnation. Now, at other places, as we'll see in a moment, the persons of the Godhead are separated. Sometimes they are equated into one. Now, in verse 3, we begin the body of the epistle. And notice that verses 3 uh, through 8 is one long, compound, complex sentence. Now, Paul says, We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Now, we give thanks. Now, if we should diagram this statement, 
we would find that the phrase always for you or literally always concerning you follows the word we give thanks. It refers back to that phrase. So Paul says we, that is Timothy and I and those who are with me, we give thanks always concerning you to whom? To God and the Father. So we give thanks giving to the God and Father of our Lord or of the Lord of us, Jesus Christ. So now here we find the persons of the Godhead are separated. God and Father, uh, who is the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have them separated in the Greek structure here. Now he says, we always give thanks concerning you to God the Father and our Master and Owner Jesus Christ, praying, that is whenever we pray we do that. How long have you been doing that, Paul? Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. Now, since we heard, or this is an aorist participle, those three words are just one word in the Greek, an aorist participle which re- literally renders having heard of your faith. So we've been doing that, having heard of your faith, or because we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, and also because we heard of the love which you have to all the saints to all the saints of the saved ones. Now, the word saint uh, simply refers to one who has been set apart unto God, that is, in salvation. Now, if you're saved, you are a saint. Now, you might not be living very saintly, but you're a saint, a set-apart one, if you're saved. Now, he says here that these Colossian believers have a love to, or literally unto, is the word, all the saints. Now, it is not possible that they could have had a love that had arrived to all believers wherever they are, but they had a love going out toward all believers wherever they are. And the word love here is a form of the word agape, which means a high valuing upon all saints in every place. So we cannot love that which we have no knowledge of existing, but we can have a love going out toward all people everywhere. And Paul knew that this was the case with these believers in Colossae because Epaphras had reported that unto him. So he says, we've been giving thanksgiving for you, uh, having heard of the faith you have in Christ and having heard of the love that you have going out toward all saints. And uh, for or uh, by means of or through or a cause of the hope which is laid up for you in the heavens. Now you have all of this Uh, because of the hope, the eager anticipation and expectation, uh, which is being reserved for you, which is laid up, or literally which is being reserved for you, it's a present participle, in the heavens. The word heaven here is a plural word in the Greek text. So he says, because of this it is laid up for you in the heavens, you have all of this, whereof you heard. Now how did they know about this salvation? How do they know about this that was laid up and reserved for them in heavens? Uh, this this eternal home. Where have you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel? Now you heard it in the word of the truth of the gospel. Notice here that the gospel is characterized by truth. The word of the truth of the gospel, the glad tidings, the good news, which says that Christ paid the penalty of our sin for us so that we would not have to pay it. Now this same message is which is come unto you. Uh, which has come and continues to be present with you. It has come to you and continues to be with you, continues to be there, as also, or even as also, it is in all the world. Now notice this gospel message has come to the whole world. It has come to you there in Colossae and still is with you as it is in all of the world and bringeth forth fruit. That is, he's saying it is bringing forth fruit, or it is fruit-bearing. It continues to be fruit-bearing throughout the world, even as it doth also in you. Now, as it is brought forth fruit in you, that you are saved people there in Colossae, so it's continuing to bring forth fruit in all of the world as that message goes forth. Now, it's been bringing forth fruit in you, and it continues to bring forth fruit in you believers there as well. Uh, How long has it been doing that? since the day you heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. Now, ever since the day you heard it, the first day that Epaphras preached that message to you, and you've come to know or to fully know the grace or the favor of God in the realm or sphere of truth. It brought forth fruit then, and it continues to bring forth fruit in your life. Now, as or 
even as ye also learned of or from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ. Now notice here, it is made clear that Paul says that they learned it from Epaphras. He also learned this message from Epaphras, and notice how he's defined. Our dear fellow servant, that is a form of the word doulos, which is a fellow bond slave. Now, Paul does not exalt himself above Epaphras, as if I'm a general in God's army and he's a, a, a lieutenant or a sergeant or something. No, he says, we are fellow bond servants. In the ranks of Christianity, we are too fond of making levels of rank among ministers, and that is not the case at all. God gives one man a worldwide ministry, and people think, boy, he's great, his name is something, and they, they think he's got the greatest reward in heaven. But God gives another man an appointment to serve in a small town off in Podunk Center somewhere, and he's never known outside of his county or his town. The man in that small area might be functioning at 90% faithfulness and capacity of what God gave him to do, and he's never known outside of his area. The man that God gives an international and worldwide ministry may function only at 70% capacity of what God gave him to do and the ability that he gave, and he makes a big splash in the world. He's known and people think he's great, but yet the other one has the greater reward before God because he was 90% faithful. God holds us accountable for what he gives us to do and not for what he hasn't given us to do. Here Paul sees him as an equal, as a bond servant of the Lord. I'm a servant of the Lord. He's a servant of the Lord. And we're both accountable to God, not to others. Now he said, who is for you? Now this word for is not gar, which would be for. But it's the Greek word huper, which means over. Who is over you a faithful minister of Christ. He's a faithful ministering servant of Christ. This word minister here is that Greek word diakonos, from which we get our English word deacon. Now, a deacon is simply a ministering servant. The word deacon and deacons in the singular and plural appears only five times combined in all of your English New Testament. However, the Greek word appears approximately 130 times, and it's usually some form of the word minister, ministering, ministered, or ministereth, or, or serve, serving, servant, serveth, or some form of that word. It simply means a ministering servant. So a, a, a deacon of the church is one who ministered and serves to the church. A deacon of God is one who ministers and serves under God, under his authority. So he's a faithful ministering servant of Christ who also declared, or declared as an area's participle, which renders, having declared to us your love in the Spirit. So he says, Epaphras is the one that declared to us here the love which you believers have back there in Colossae, and you have it in the Spirit of Christ. Now, let's get the continuity of that long sentence. Paul said, I've been giving thanks, I give thanks always concerning you people there in Colossae, uh, I give the thanks to God and Father of the, of the Lord of us, who is Jesus Christ, whenever we're praying and we've been doing it, having heard of the faith you have in Christ and the love that you have going out to all saints. And you have that because of the hope which is reserved in heaven for you. And you heard about it uh, when you heard the truth of the gospel, and you heard that from Epaphras. And Epaphras is a faithful servant who told us about it, and, and the one from whom you learned the gospel. And He's the one that told us of the love that you have. Now, verse 9. For this cause, the word for, again, is not gar, it is dia, which means by means of or through, by means of or through this cause. Now, this cause, he's talking about the good report that he's just mentioned up above. Now, because of this good report, we also, and the word we is emphatic, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you. We do not cease to pray for or over you. Now, well, we don't cease praying over you people back there. Ever since Epaphras gave us the report concerning you, we've been praying over you ever since that time. And also, and to desire. To desire is not an infinitive as it is translated here, but those two words are one word in the Greek and it's a present participle and desiring or making requests or asking that you might be filled with the knowledge or literally the full knowledge of his will. 
Now, our prayer for all of you believers is that you would be filled with the full knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now, if we diagram this, we would find that the word spiritual refers both to the word wisdom and to the word understanding. So we've been praying for you that you be filled with the full knowledge of God's will in all spiritual wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now, you may have a knowledge of God's will for your life, and you may know what God would have you to do, but is it with spiritual wisdom and spiritual understanding? We need to have a spiritual wisdom and a spiritual understanding of the purpose of God for our life and His will for us. Now, why do you pray for them for that, Paul? That you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Now, the word that and your word might uh, are added words. The word might walk is just one word in the Greek, and it's an aorist infinitive. Uh, So he says, to walk ye worthily, not worthy, but worthily of the Lord. There's none of us worthy of the Lord, and we can never be worthy of the Lord, but we can behavior, live our life and behave in such a manner that we are walking, that is, we're ordering our behavior worthily of the Lord in a worthy manner, and to the point that we please Him in all things. Now, what do we mean by that? Let me illustrate it like this. Your great-grandfather was in the lumber business, He never had a written contract. His word was his bond. He was always faithful. If anything was sold and it wasn't right, brought back to him, he made it right with no question. Your father inherited the business, and he carried it on the same way. Now, you inherit the business, and if you carry on that business worthily of the family name, then you will do it in the same way. Now, If we order our behavior worthily of the Lord, then we are living our life and behaving in such a manner that we are living in a manner that would bring honor to the Lord and living up to His standard which He has laid down for us in the Word of God. So he says we're praying that you can order your behavior worthily of the Lord unto all pleasing, that is pleasing Him in all areas, and also being fruitful in every good work. Now, we can become fruitful in the good works that we perform, that is, fruitful for the glory of God and not for ourselves as such. Uh, We become fruitful in every good work when we are ordering our behavior in a manner that's worthily of the Lord, that manifests Him in our lives, and, he says furthermore, an increasing in, or into, the word is ice, and increasing into the knowledge or the full knowledge of the God or of the Godhead. Now, in the Greek text here, the article the precedes the word God. Ordinarily, not a hundred percent, but ordinarily, when the article the precedes the word God, it refers to the Godhead, the Trinity. When you have the word God without the article preceding it, it ordinarily refers to the essence of what God is. So here he's talking about, I want you to increase in the full knowledge of the Godhead. Now notice something here. Remember, the heretics who came in said that Jesus Christ was not God, a very absolute God. They did believe in God, but not that Christ was God. Now he's come to the point of telling them, and even the heretics who were there would accept this up to this point, to a full knowledge of the Godhead. Strengthened with all might. The word strengthened is a present participle. Being strengthened with all power. Now, this word might is the Greek word dunamis, uh, from which we get our English word dynamite, and it speaks like uh, of a real power as you would have in dynamite, according to his glorious power. Now, he said, I want you to be being strengthened with all power according to his glorious power. Now, this word power is a different word. This is the word kratos which means a manifestation of power according to the manifested power of His glory, literally. According to the manifested power or dominion of His glory or exalted dignity, honor, and reputation of Him. Now, there is a manifestation of His power and of His dominion that He has. So that's a totally different word altogether. And you should have all of this in your life under what result? unto all patience and long-suffering with joyfulness. Now notice here he says, the end result of all of this is patience, that is with persons, 
and long-suffering, which is ordinarily used in reference to things. So you are patient with persons, and you are long-suffering with things and situations with joyfulness. In other words, it's not a grin and bear it type situation. You can put up with a lot of things from a lot of people and a lot of situations and still do it joyfully. Now, if we follow in the things of God. So he's praying for these believers there in Colossae that they would be so filled with a knowledge of God's will and spiritual wisdom and spiritual understanding that they could order their lives worthily of him and, and to the point they please him in all things and be filled with every uh, fruitful in all their good works and they could increase to the full knowledge of the Godhead and be strengthened in him with his power and might under the end result that they can have patience with all persons and long-suffering with all things with a joyfulness. And furthermore, he said, I want you to be giving thanks, he says in verse 12. Giving thanks to the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Now, notice what he says here. You should be able yourselves to be giving thanksgiving to the Father, who hath made, or an aorist participle, who having made us meet are competent, are qualified to be takers of the inheritance. Uh, that is, that we could be uh, partakers uh, of the portion of the lot that God has laid out for us, for the saints, which is in light. This God, I want you to give thanksgiving, this God who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, or the Son of his love. Either way you read it, his dear Son, the Son of his love, he's talking about Jesus Christ. Now notice he says, this Father is the one who delivered us from, that is, out of or out from, the authority of darkness. Notice the word power here. We've already seen two words rendered power. Dunamis, kratos, and now exousia. This word power, exousia, speaks of power in the sense of authority, such as a president or a law enforcement official. So he says, he had delivered us out of or out from the authority of darkness. Now he's talking about darkness out of the kingdom of sin and Satan, under that power, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his son, Jesus Christ. Now notice that word translated. That is a word that's used in the secular writings of the same day of the writing of the New Testament in this sense. Here is a person who is a citizen of a kingdom over here. That person is picked up, transported, and transplanted into another kingdom under the authority of another king. And that is a picture of what has taken place for us in our salvation. Here we are in the kingdom of sin and Satan under his authority and power. God has picked us up, transported us, and transplanted us into the kingdom of his son, Jesus Christ. Now, notice it says, into his kingdom. There are people today who shudder if you talk about in salvation entering any kind of a kingdom. But yet, it says very clearly and distinctly that at our salvation we are transplanted into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. But who is this Jesus Christ into whose kingdom we've been transplanted? Verse 14, the one in whom... That is, in his Son, in whom we have the redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of the sins. Now, notice here, it's, the way it's stated in our English is that we have redemption through the blood of Christ, even the forgiveness of sins, as if forgiveness of sins were something greater than redemption. But notice that the word even is added by the translators. Now, I may at times speak of a word that's in italics that's not italicized in your English Bible. The reason is this. In the average printing of a King James Bible, only about half of the words which were added by the translators are in italics. I cannot tell you why that's true. I don't know. It was just printed that way the first time and it's continued to be. But if you could acquire what is known as a Newberry Bible, it's a King James Version, a Newberry Bible then it italicizes about every word that was added by the translators. Now, the word even here is added, so what it literally says is this, in Christ is the one in whom we have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. They are equal. If you have redemption, you have forgiveness. If you've been forgiven, 
you've been redeemed. You have the redemption. So it's in Christ that we have that. But he goes on defining this person of Jesus Christ a little further in verse 15. Who is the image of the invisible God. Notice that little verb is. That is a verb tense that in English we do not have an identical uh, uh, verb for it. Now it is present tense in Greek. We have presence in English, but they're not identical. Present tense in English is right now at the present time. In Greek, present tense is a present state of condition with an antecedent condition. In other words, it existed prior to the present in order to be present now. And which condition continues without cessation. It's what we call duty or linear action. So it's that which was, which is, and which continues to be. It embraces past, present, and future all in one. So he says, Jesus Christ is the one who was, who is, and who shall always continue to be uh, the image of the invisible God. Now notice the word image. The word image is the little Greek word icon, E-I-K-O-N, icon. That's the word from which we get our English word icon. Now you know what an icon is. Icon is those little statues that Catholics and others have that represent a saint or a god or something else. Now, the Greek word means more than representation. The Greek word icon carries the meaning of representation and manifestation. So Jesus Christ is the one who always was, who is, and always shall be the only visible manifestation and the only visible representation of the whole Godhead who is invisible. Now, notice he is the image, the, the manifestation of the invisible, comma, the God, the Godhead. So God is invisible spirit. God has no physical shape nor form. You might say, well now, wait a minute. Did not God say, let us create man in our image and our likeness? Yes, he did. But that image and likeness was not physical image and likeness. It was rational and moral, as was pointed out in several portions of the Word of God. Now, something you can recall very readily. Remember, remember in the Old Testament scriptures, God gave a command. He said, thou shalt not make any images like unto me. I'm not like anything you've ever seen. I'm not like anything in the heavens. I'm not like anything upon the earth. I'm not like the beast of the field. I'm not like the fowl of the air. I'm not like the fishes of the sea. I'm not like man, male nor female. So don't try to make any images like unto me. That makes it obvious that he was not physical image and likeness. So Jesus Christ is the visible manifestation, representation of the whole Godhead who is invisible. Now, Jesus Christ always has been the only manifestation. You say, I understand how he became the manifestation of God when he was born as an infant and placed in the manger and grew into adulthood, crucified, and ascended back into heaven. I understand that. But how is it he's always been the only visible manifestation of God? Well, in the Old Testament, every time God made a manifestation of himself, it was by means of, through, and in the person of Jesus Christ that it was done. One you can recall very readily. When the three angels appeared to Abraham there on the plains, and uh, they were fed a meal, two of them left to go down to Sodom to deliver Lot, and one of them remained there, and uh, Abraham discerned that this one was the Lord, and he interceded, remember? Said, if you find 50 righteous down there, will you spare the city? 40, 30, 20, 10, and he stopped there at 10. That one was the Lord. It doesn't matter whether the Lord appeared in the form of a man or of an angel or a burning bush or in any other form. It was by means of and through and in the person of Jesus Christ that he ever made a visible manifestation of himself. Now, he is the one who always has been, is, and always shall be the only visible manifestation and representation of the Godhead who is invisible. Then he goes on to define him further. The firstborn of every creature or the firstborn of all creation. Now there are some groups who would teach that Jesus Christ was just the first thing God ever created in the highest order of his creation. That he was not the creator and he's not God. And they would use this verse to prove that. The firstborn of all creation. You say, well the way you literally translate it makes it sound more like that. Well, no. Because the understanding of this statement is totally dependent upon the definition of the word firstborn. The word firstborn here carries the same concept as it does in the Old Testament. 
Now, if we should take an hour to go through and analyze this phrase as it's used in the Old Testament scriptures, you'll find that it refers to one who has the first place of authority and power. The one with the preeminence, the firstborn in the Old Testament family, a Jewish family, was not necessarily the one who was born first. The one who got the position of the firstborn was more often one of the others. Now, for instance, many times a female was the first one born into a family and no female ever got the position of the firstborn. It was always a male. You say, well, it was the first male born. Not necessarily so. There is a principle throughout all of Scripture, the first being set aside of the, for the second, the first Adam for the second Adam, the first birth for the second birth, and on. Now, something you can recall very readily is this, Esau and Jacob. Esau was firstborn, but Jacob got the blessing and the birthright, the position of the firstborn, which speaks of the one that has the first place of authority and power or the preeminence. So here it says that Jesus Christ is the one with the first place of authority and power or preeminence over all creation. Now this same word is used down in verse 18. Look at it. He, speaking of Christ, is the head of the body of the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Now firstborn here cannot possibly mean having birth given unto nor having been brought into existence. Now when it says Jesus Christ was the firstborn from the dead, it's obviously speaking of his resurrection. Was his birth given unto him at that time? Definitely not. Uh, was he brought into existence at that time? Obviously not. So the word firstborn, and this is the exact same Greek word as you have up above, firstborn cannot possibly mean having birth given unto nor brought into existence. It means the one with the first place of authority or power or the preeminence over all creation. My! What a place of authority he has. Notice that Jesus Christ is the one into whose kingdom we've been transplanted, the one in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins, the one who always has been, is, and always shall be the only visible manifestation and representation of the whole Godhead that's invisible. And he's the one with the preeminence over all of creation. Why does he have such a position as that? For by him were all things created that are in heaven, and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Now let's go back and analyze what all this says. For by. That little word by is not dia, it is en, which in English is in the realm or in the sphere of. Because it was in the realm or sphere of him, that is, in the realm or sphere of his authority and power, were the all things created. Now the article the appears several times throughout this passage that is not translated. The all things were created in the realm of sphere of Christ. Now what kind of things? All things that are in the heavens, the word heaven is a plural word, and that are in or upon the earth. All things in the heavens and all things upon the earth, everything was created by Christ. What kind of all things? Doesn't matter the visible and the invisible. Can you think of anything that's either not upon the earth or in the heavens? Can you either think of anything that's either not visible or invisible? He makes it very clear that nothing is left out. It was all created by Christ. Doesn't matter what kind of visible and invisible things they are, whether they be thrones or dominions, which means lordships, or principalities, which is literally rulers, or powers, which is authorities, the all things were created by means of or through him and unto him. It was for him or unto his honor and glory that everything was created. Now think of this for a moment. Here we are seeing the magnificence and the power of the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, think of the power that he expended. The word of God says he spoke and it was. It was brought into existence by his speaking. How much power was expended? Well, let's think of it for a moment. Do you recall Einstein's equation that E equals mc squared? The amount of energy in anything is equal to the weight of the mass of the matter multiplied by the speed of light squared. Now, energy, everything that we have, everything that there is can be reduced to energy. All matter can be reduced to energy. And how much energy is in it is, is dependent upon this equation to find out. Now, uh, we talk about everything being made up of, of atoms. 
a little atom, and it has a nucleus, and has neutrons and protons moving around, and the number of them there determines the density of the material. Now, for instance, let's take, a, let's take a, something like this watch that I have here. We take the weight of that watch, and uh, we multiply that weight by the speed of light squared. Now, what's the speed of light? 186,282 miles per second. So you, and this is actually done in the metric system, which would be about 300,000 kilometers. So 300,000 times 300,000 gives you a pretty good number. And you multiply that by the number of grams in this, and there's a little over more than 28 grams per ounce. So now you multiply this with the time, times what you get when you multiply 300,000 times 300,000, you get an idea of how much energy is in this little watch. There, if properly extracted, there's enough here to blow this place off of the map, to just do away with this building and a lot else that's around it. But now, that gives you an idea of how much energy Christ expended. But let's take not only this little watch, let's take the whole building. Let's take the world, the earth. Let's take all the air in the atmosphere. Matter is anything that has weight. Air has weight. Let's not only take this, but let's take the whole galaxy in which we live. Let's take the whole universe with all of its billions of galaxies. Now let's take the weight of all that's out there. And we are told that there are materials out there and some of the stars, the reason they haven't burned out and the reason our sun hasn't burned out, it's of such dense material that something no larger than this watch can weigh a ton. Now, and our sun is a very small star and we have them out there many, many times larger than our sun and if they have that kind of weight in them, how much energy did Christ expend when he spoke? And it was, and it did not deplete him in the least, nor make him tired. My, what a magnificent person, how powerful Jesus Christ is. He's the one into whose kingdom we've been transplanted. He's the one in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He's the one that always has been, is, and always shall be, the only visible manifestation and representation of the Godhead that's invisible. And he's the one who has preeminence the first place of authority and power over all of creation because it was in the realm of sphere of his authority that all things were created and it was for him and unto his honor and glory they were created. But he's not through yet. Notice in verse 17, and he, the word he is in the emphatic position, it's to be emphasized. And he is before all things and by or in him the all things consist, subsist, cohere, are whole together. Did you get what that said? It is not only in the realm or sphere of his authority and power that all things are created, but it's in the realm or sphere of his authority and power that all things are held together. He has the power of holding all things together. Now, does not the word of God teach us that coming at a future time, that this world shall dissolve and pass away into nothingness and God create and bring into existence a new creation? Now, when we analyze the atom, when we analyze the atom, scientists say we don't understand why all of creation doesn't just go. What holds that little atom together? We don't know. Did you realize that in its own little orbit of things, that in the scientific community they talk about, about an unknown cohesive force an unknown cohesive force. Now, most people in the scientific community say that because we don't find anything around that little atom to hold it together, that the whole universe ought to just go bluey into one colossal blast with every particle blowing infinitely apart, or the majority of them say it ought to collapse as a great vacuum just into nothingness. Why doesn't it happen? We don't know. But look what the Word of God says that Jesus Christ is the one who holds it together. And again, Jesus Christ holds us all together because the Word of God says the time will come when he takes his hand off of it. It shall all dissolve and all of that energy returns to the source from whence it came and God speaks into existence a new creation in which there is no defilement nor sin. 
we are looking at here the greatness, the immensity, and the power of the person of Jesus Christ. Now, it is obvious that the Creator must be greater than the created. Now, think of this for a moment. On our earth, we live in the Milky Way galaxy. And in this Milky Way galaxy, there are some 100 billion stars, but only about 6,000 of them are visible by the naked eye. Now, traveling at the speed of light, 186,282 miles per second, in round figures would equal about 700 million miles per hour. 700 million miles per hour. Do you realize that it would take four years to reach the nearest star in our galaxy at 700 million miles per hour? And it would take 75,000 years to reach the most distant star in our galaxy, and it would take 100,000 years to go all the way across the galaxy from one edge to the other, traveling at 700 million miles per hour. And, and we talk about traveling 10 times the speed of light. It would still take 10,000 years to just go across this galaxy. And we're talking about intergalactic galactic travel. Let's get real. Now, Astronomers tell us that there's almost one trillion other galaxies in our universe which have been detected. Almost one trillion that's been detected and counted, and we haven't detected all of them yet. The universe is immense. Now, to reach the most distant galaxy ever seen would take 8 billion years at 700 million miles per hour. And it would take another billion years to cross that galaxy. Now that's how much larger that galaxy is than the one in which we live. Take a hundred thousand years to cross it and take a billion years to cross that one. And we don't know the most distant things of the universe as yet. With our telescopes out in space, we're discovering that there's more and more out there than we ever dreamed of. It seems to be bigger all the time. On December the 14th in 1997, astronomers saw something that had never been seen before that they didn't know existed, and that was a gamma ray burst. Now, in Italy, an uh, uh, astronomer saw this. He called Columbia University, told them about it. They called others, and scientists all over the world, astronomers got on their telescopes and observed this, and they saw this gamma ray burst for the first time that had ever been witnessed. This gamma ray burst it was calculated to be 12 billion light years away. 12 billion light years away from us. Now, how far is that? Well, a light year is equal to 5.9 trillion miles. 5.9 trillion miles. So the total distance would be over 700 billion trillion miles away. And the universe is even bigger than that. What, why are we doing Is this a science lesson? No. The Creator is obviously greater than the created. Jesus Christ, my friend, is not just that super Santa Claus, that old man upstairs, not just our elder brother or that lowly Galilean. Jesus Christ is the God, a very absolute God, that is greater and infinite and greater than all of the creation because He's the one that brought it into existence and He's the one who holds it together. But He's not through yet. Verse 18. And He... Once more, the word he is in the emphatic position. He is the head of the body, the church, the assembly. The word church should always be a rendered assembly. He's the head of the, the assembly who is the beginning. He's the beginning of that church, the assembly, and the firstborn from among the dead ones. Why? That in all things he might have the preeminence of the first place of authority and power. My friend, Christ must have preeminence in your assembly as well as preeminence over the universe, if he doesn't have preeminence in your church and assembly, you might as well take out the pews and roll up the carpet and start a roller rink because at least you would give people physical exercise. He must have the preeminence, the first place of authority and power in every church. And he's the firstborn from the dead that he might have that. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Now notice here, the words, the Father, that, are in italics. 
the concept is here, but what it literally renders is this. For in him, that is in Christ, all the fullness was well pleased to dwell. All the fullness of what was well pleased to dwell in him? All the fullness of the Godhead was well pleased to dwell in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, if the fullness of the Godhead was well pleased to dwell in him, then obviously he was nothing less than the fullness of God, a very absolute God, a very God. If the fullness of the Godhead was in him, then he was nothing less than the fullness of God. So in him, all the fullness of the Godhead was well pleased to dwell. Now, since the fullness of the Godhead was well pleased to dwell in him, not only was the fullness pleased to dwell in him, but it goes on to say in verse 20, and the Godhead was well pleased not only to dwell in him, but also and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in the heavens. Now, in the Greek text in verse 20, the second phrase precedes the first phrase, and the two verses read like this. For in him, in Christ, all the fullness was well pleased to dwell, and through him, well pleased through him, to reconcile all things unto himself, having made peace through the blood of the cross of him, through him, whether the things upon the earth are the things in the heavens. Did you get what that said? That the fullness of the Godhead was not only well pleased to dwell in the person of Jesus Christ, but the fullness of the Godhead was well pleased to reconcile all things unto himself by the means of the blood of the cross of Christ. What all things? All things in the heavens as well as all things upon the earth. There has never been a Bible expositor, there's never been a theologian who fathomed the depths of verse 20. I can assure you that the reconciling work of Jesus Christ was sufficient for far, far, far more than just the salvation of all humanity. He said all things in the heaven as well as all things upon the earth. What does that mean? I don't know. I do know that that reconciling work of Jesus Christ is the basis whereby any human being who will believe it and receive it and accept it can be saved from the eternal condemnation and have a home in heaven. I know that that's a basis upon which God can lift the curse from this earth and restore it to its pristine purity for the millennial reign. I know a lot of things are involved. I know that it does not include the fallen angels because the Bible specifically tells us that. What does it mean, all things in the heavens? I don't know. Is there intelligent life out there that needs to be redeemed? I don't know. You see... Many people say, well, if there's intelligent life out there on another planet, somewhere else in another universe or in, in this place, then did Christ go there and die too? Are they fallen? Are they unfallen? Did Christ have to go there to die? The Bible says he died once for all. They say if there's a people out there, then we have theological problems. I don't think so. See, I, I, I don't know whether there's intelligent life out there or not. Sometimes I wonder if there is here. But anyway... Is there intelligent life out there? If they're fallen or unfallen, if they're unfallen and we make contact with them, they're bound to become fallen, that's for sure. It doesn't matter. I don't really think there is. But if we learn with all certainty before the day is over that there's intelligent life out there, they're covered under the reconciling work of Jesus Christ on planet Earth because it says all things in the heavens as well as all things upon the earth. They're covered. So I can assure you, my friend, that the reconciling work of Jesus Christ is sufficient for all humanity who will believe. 